paper and go over the back and have it gone over today. And we've been talking about the book of Psalms. And Daniel, I'm going to be picking on you again. How many sections is the book of Psalms divided into? Five. Very good. And what do they correspond or go along with? They go right along with the first five books of the Bible. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. When we look at the book of Psalms, there was no one author because the book of Psalms is a huge book of, is a huge Jewish, Jewish song book. So there are no authors for one book, but rather there are many songs with multiple authors, David writing most of them. We've looked in the past at different psalms as well and gone in detail. Today's psalm is a little bit more difficult to do that than the psalms in the past. Why? Because we are going to be looking at Psalm 119. Psalm 119 is the longest psalm in the entire book of Psalms. And there are, and I wish I would put this in my notes, but a quick glance at Psalm 119 will tell us how many verses there are in that psalm. 156? 176. So you can understand why I'm not going to sit here and read the entire psalm. <laughs> However, I will give you guys about three minutes to glance through the psalm yourself, and then we will discuss the typical keywords, key phrases, key verses. I don't expect you to get through the whole psalm, but we will be able to talk about it a little bit in detail. So if you want to go ahead and find Psalm chapter 119, Psalm 119, Carouse through it for a few moments, and then we'll talk about it. Psalm 119. Yeah, there's a lot of words in 176 verses. Is that what you want to look for words? Just crowds through Psalm 119, basically a quick read through and get yourself familiar with that. I apologize, I did not realize last week that we would be looking at Psalm 119 already. But for future reference, for next week, go ahead and read Psalm 120. The next 15 Psalms, Psalms are going to go in order of that. We'll discuss one Psalm a week. But this week will be Psalm 119, and next week, Psalm 120. So just quickly familiarize yourself with one Psalm 19. Don't have to be perfect, but just give yourself a quick understanding of it. Quick read through. Casually going through Psalm 119.
going to start looking at Psalm 119. Like I said, this was just to get a quick introduction to Psalm 119. If you had to guess what the subject matter of Psalm 119 is, what do you think it would be? What's the main subject being discussed here? God's Word. So Psalm 119 is the longest psalm in the entire book, and it is completely dedicated to the law, or God's Word. It has been described as this, um, and said by Reverend um, W. Simmons, this psalm shines and shows itself among the rest, a star in the firmament of the psalms of the first and greatest magnitude. There are those that would say that this psalm is basically the same as taking the G string or a single note or a chord or a, chord, a single note and striking it over and over and over again. Because it all talks about the same thing. However, Spurgeon disagreed. He claimed that those type of commentaries that make such a statement, if they would only study this psalm itself, they would find that there is a plethora of information and material and insight and meat to the psalm that they cannot fathom. It's too deep for them. They do not realize the abundance that God has hidden in this psalm. It has been deemed a psalm like no other. If we would study the book of Psalms, uh, if I would brought it out in different ways, we would actually find that there's different classification of psalms, prophetic psalms, wisdom psalms, probably literature psalms. But if you could categorize this psalm amongst any of the other ones, they said that this one would stand alone in itself. It is a star shining bright in the firmament, and there's none to compare to it. If we would have to pull out some key verses, what do you might be, think would be some key verses? I know I didn't give you enough time to read the whole psalm, but what do you think might pop out to describe the psalm or summarize it? So maybe salvation unto thy word. Yes, sir. So maybe Psalm 41. And then uh, 10, 73. Thy hand hath made me and, and fashioned me. Give me understand that I may learn thy commandments. So maybe 41 and 73. Does anybody else have any other thoughts you might think that might summarize this chapter in a nutshell when it comes to the verses? Verse 11. What does verse 11 state? <laughs> Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. When we go throughout this um, psalm itself, we find the psalmist constantly going back between the word of God and revealing his sin to himself or asking for forgiveness. So he's concerned about sinning against the Word of God. But yet he's always praising up the Word of God. He wants to hide in his heart. It's forever hidden in heaven, um, settled in heaven. What are some other verses that might summarize this? Anybody else have any other thoughts? I know there is an abundance of verses to choose from. But how about verse 18, where the Bible states, Open, thine, uh, open thou mine eyes, that I may behold wondrous things out of thy law. Does anybody else want to add anything out to it? There's, like I said, there's a plethora of verses. We can go into 27, 89, 130, 160 as well, where they read, and I find them. Make me to understand the way of thy precepts, so I talk of thy wondrous works. We talk, talk about 89. Forever, O Lord, thy word is settled in heaven. 130. The entrance of thy words giveth light. 
it gives under, understanding unto the simple. And 160. Thy word is true from the beginning, and every one of thy righteous judgments endureth forever. Now, what about some key phrases we might talk about? Or key words. We'll just lump those two together so we can continue on. Some key phrases or key words. What might pop out? There should be a number of different words that pop out from the very beginning because if the subject matter is the law of the word of God, there should be words like word, commandments, statutes, any of those because that's what we're talking about. The Word of God. Does anybody else want to add anything else to it? Whether key phrases or key words. Or what about when it comes to key words, I have teach, diligent, seek, and we could really list a numerous of other ones. Like I said, there are no wrong answers when it comes to the key words, key phrases, or key verses. It's just a matter of trying to summarize it in a nutshell is all they're doing. When it comes to key phrases, I have deal bountifully with thy, bountifully with thy servant, and teach me thy statutes. Because when we look at here, the author is pleading, God, I love thy law, but teach me thy ways. We see him saying, Lord, basically, I'm a sinner, I've done wrong, teach me that I may not do this. In the latter part of the verse, he praises the law for keeping him from sin. He talks about those that are coming against him, but he will delight and place his trust in the Lord and in his law, because his ways are perfect. We, I like to talk about, in the Old Testament, verses that are quoted in the New Testament. When it comes, especially when we've been dealing with the Psalms, and from what I can gather with Psalm 119, it was never quoted in the New Testament that I could find. There is no real history of this chapter that I'm aware of. And when it comes to the poetic style and the division of the Psalm itself, they kind of merge and bleed into one another as far as I'm concerned. Before we talk about those, but let's talk about how... Let's talk about Christ in the psalm. According to Keith L. Brooks in Psalm 119, the disciples of Christ who sit at his feet and let him interpret the word to them are often better skilled than the doctors of divinity. The best way to find the wondrous things is to saturate the study of the word in prayer, which makes it possible for Christ to speak to us out of the word through the Holy Ghost. Now, when we look at the poetic style and the division of this, if you look down through, at least in my Bible, well, let me just see, I'm not sure about it. In my Bible at home that I use to study, it has divisions. And it will say things like Aleph and Tab. And it'll have different things. I'm just trying to see if it's in. So Dave has it divided as well. You'll see words like Gimel. What is this? When we look at Psalm 119, it is actually set an acrostic uh, psalm, and it is set up using the Hebrew alphabet, and is divided into eight verses per section. So there are 22 letters in the Hebrew alphabet. Within each division under each alphabet, which it is in order according to the Hebrew alphabet, there are eight verses. Each one of these verses begin with that letter of the Hebrew alphabet. Now this is interesting for several reasons. First of all, for us, the Bible always points to Jesus Christ. And if we look at the first letter of the Hebrew alphabet, and we have that chart that I printed off for you with all the alphabet, with the entire Hebrew alphabet in order, with their meanings, it should be Appendix D, if you look at the very first letter, it should be a left. And now I'm breaking out my notes. One more to find my chart. And 
And if you look right next to the right hand side of the left, you should see the literal meaning is an ox. If you go down to the very last letter of the Hebrew alphabet, it is um, spelled T A B. I've seen it pronounced uh, spelled T A U. Tav. It is a mark, signature, or cross. When we think about the life of Christ, an ox is an animal for sacrifice. It represents also a servant. It is one who works. If you think about Christ in his ministry, is that not what he was? He was the Lamb of God. He was the ultimate sacrifice. And I think it's interesting that it begins with the ox. Because what did Jesus say? He said, I am the Alpha and the Omega. And the end is the cross. And I think it's interesting that the last Hebrew letter means uh, signature. And it's represented by a cross. And what makes that interesting? That the signature of Jesus Christ would be the cross. That is what he's known for. He died on the cross. Yes, he resurrected from the dead. But if he never would have died on the cross, he never would have been able to forgive our sins or been the sacrifice for our sins. Now, when we look at the, uh, Psalm 119, there are multiple words that represent the word of God in this psalm. I threw down several. Depending on which commentator you read, those they'll number out differently. Some will number it according to the version of the Bible they're using. Others will use it according to the Hebrew words that are used within this chapter just to describe the, the, uh, the word of God. With mine, I just broke it down into law, word or words, statutes, promise, promises, testimonies, ordinances, judgments, precepts, ways, commandments. So there are multiple, a plethora of words within Psalm 119 that describe it to, uh, or it's used to describe the word of God. Now, within this last section, I'm going to jump back and forth a little bit. But when we look at the name of God used within this psalm, once again, looking at our King James Version of the Bible, we would find that the word Lord is in caps, especially in, at the end of verse 1. And what does that mean when the word Lord is in all caps in the King James Version of the Bible? Yahweh, Jehovah, is referring to God as the self-existent God. The God that is all in all. We're not talking about God, uh, Jehovah, uh, Jehovah Jireh, or the Lord, my uh, God is my banner, or God is my tri um, tribute in time of storm, or, and there's a plethora of other ones that for some reason they're all evading my mind right now. But we can go through the names of God, and none of them are listed here. Because we're not using God, uh, God's not being something for one particular task. But rather, it's Jehovah. God is all in all. He's self-existent. He is outside of time, space, and matter. He just is God. Doesn't matter what you think he is or who you think he is. He is all supreme and self-existent, and there is none like him. Now, it's interesting one word, and it's important that we, when we read this psalm, that we get an idea of how the author views himself. Are there any, as you were reading along this psalm in 119, was there anything that stuck out on how the author viewed himself? <laughs> and I know I'm picking and looking for something specific, but if we had to get a feel for the author, how does he perceive himself? If we got up and we put our hand over our heart and looked at the American flag, we are acknowledging something very specific. 
we are recognizing that we are a citizen of the United States of America. This is my country. This is where I live. You know, what do they say? Like it or leave it. If you don't like it here, then leave. What does verse 19 inform us concerning the author? Someone will read verse 19. When I'm a stranger in the earth, hide not thy commandments from me. He is a stranger in the earth. So what does that tell us? It tells us that he doesn't see his citizenship as being part of this earth, but rather he's a journeyman. He's just traveling through. He has no real roots to any location on this earth. He doesn't want to be tied down. When we look at a journeyman, he is somebody that is traveling. He's going from one place to the other. And if he's a journey, a sojourner or traveler on this earth, that tells us if his citizenship is not on earth, then where would his citizenship lie? Heaven. It's in heaven. He had one of two locations, and hopefully it wasn't hell. But no, with his love of the Lord and his law, he tells us he's just a traveler on this earth, but he has a citizenship, a citizenship somewhere, and that is heaven. And we look at the word of God, there is another person who considered himself just a traveler on this earth. And what, um, if someone would please read Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 10. Hebrews 11 and verse 10. So we're talking about Abraham. Did Abraham consider himself a citizenship, a citizen of this world? No. He looked for a city that God built. Not something that man built, but he looked for a city which hath foundations, whose builder and maker is God. And really, if we sat down and thought about it, what is the city that Abraham looked for? The Bible does reveal it to us. The city of God. The city of God, which is, I know now I'm pulling, but more, but more specifically, right, brought, New, Jerusalem. New Jerusalem. The New Jerusalem. The foundation upon which the prophets and the apostles is built. And when it comes to us, what does 2 Corinthians 5.20 read? 2 Corinthians 5.20. Ambassadors for Christ is to God who beseech you by us we pray you Christ to be reconciled to God. So we are ambassadors for Christ. What is an ambassador? He's somebody that goes to another country to represent his country. If we went down to Washington, D.C., there would be a bunch of ambassadors from different countries from around the world. We have embassies in different countries of the world that represent the United States in that country. So when it comes to Abraham wasn't a citizen of this world, the author of Psalm 119 wasn't an ambassador, was not a citizen of this world. It reveals to us the same thing that we should feel because as children of the living God, this world really is not our home. We are just dirty men passing through. We are traveling from one destination to another. We get ourselves in trouble when we get comfortable and settled in this world. That's when sin starts to creep in. That's when our eyes get focused, off of, uh, unfocused and off of Jesus Christ. That's when our eyes get focused on our problems and this happening and that happening. Why? Because we have forgotten that we are not citizens of this world, but rather we are only traveling on. And we get so wrapped up in life that we forget that. We are citizens of another country. We are citizens of a city that hath foundations. 
and is the New Jerusalem there in, South, in Revelation chapter 21, if I remember correctly. So when we look at Psalm 119, the author reveals that and portrays that and ingrains that into us once again. When we read Psalm 119, regardless of his enemies and everybody else coming against him, he does not view this as his home. He's just traveling through. And because he's just traveling through, he doesn't find his comfort in family or friends or anything else. What does he find his comfort in? In the Word of God. He finds comfort in his God and his Word. His Word is where he goes to when he's in time of trouble. And it's interesting because we can see his spiritual maturity in Psalm 119. As we read Psalm 119, the first half of the psalm, at least up until verse 96, he's pleading with God. God, I need help. He's doing this. He's doing that. God, I find a light in thy word. But, you know, everyone's coming against me. They're lying against me. Yada, yada, yada. And the list goes on and on and on. God, help me with my sin. Help me overcome. But once we reach Psalm 97, all the way through um, verse 104, that's where we can specifically notice the change and the transition in his tone of voice. And we can see his spiritual maturity, maturity go from, and I hate to say being that one of a baby, because maybe he's not necessarily a babe in Christ. We don't have to be a babe in Christ to say, God, I have sinned, help me with this, help me with this, and help me to overcome. Sometimes that just deals with our relationship with Christ. But the closer we get to God, the more we're begging, God, help me not to sin, help me not to sin. And we reach that point of being an overcomer and we say, God, this is happening, this is happening, but help me through this time. And as we read um, 97 through 104, and I'll go ahead and read that, notice the transition in his tone. The Bible states, Oh, how I love thy law. It is my meditation all the day. Thou through thy commandment has made me wiser than my enemies, for they are ever with me. I have more understanding than all my teachers. For my testimonies are my meditation. I understand more than the ancients because I keep thy precepts. I have refrained my feet from every evil way that I might keep thy word. I have not departed from thy judgments, for thou hast taught me how sweet are thy words unto my taste, yea, sweeter than a honeycomb to my mouth. Through thy precepts I get understanding, before I hate every false way. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet, and a light unto my path. I have sworn, and I will perform it, that I will keep thy righteous judgments. I am afflicted very much. Quicken me, O Lord, according to unto thy word. If we look back in the first half, we see, uh, like in verse 66, teach me good. Teach me good judgment and knowledge, for I have believed thy commandment. When we get to verse 97, if you would read this in your own time throughout the week and then recognize the transition there in 97, you can see clearly that his, mature, his spiritual maturity has progress. How does it progress? Well, we don't become spiritually mature overnight. But it comes when we are constantly digging in the Word of God, building our relationship with Him. We may not hear the audible voice of God 24 hours a day, seven days a week. But there is one way that we can know the Word of God and know what He likes, His will, His do's, His don'ts, His likes, His dislikes, there's a way that we can get to know to God 24-7 without hearing his audible voice. And that is by reading the word of God. And the author of the psalm may not have been listening to the voice of God 24-7. He might have been communing with him and talking with him, praying. But he was learning the word of God. God, this is your word. I may not understand it all, but reveal it to me. Teach me. Teach me thy ways. Should that not be our prayer as well? We may not hear the voice of God 24-7. When they say, hear his voice, his audible voice, 
But we can dig into the Word of God 24-7. We can study the Word of God 24-7. And when we study the Word of God and couple it with prayer, that's when our spiritual maturity awakens. It grows. Because we're getting to know God. We're getting to know His voice. It, doesn't, it is not something that just happens overnight. And by the end, in verse 164, the Bible states, Seven times a day do I praise thee because of thy righteous judgment. When we look at that number seven in the Bible, do you remember what the number seven reveals to us? What it represents? Perfection. Completeness. So maybe the author does not physically seven times a day praise God because of his righteous judgments. Maybe he does it more than that. But he does it completely. He does it wholeheartedly. You know what, God? I will praise thee because you've done this for me. You've done that for me. You've brought me here. you brought me there. You know, while I'm a journeyman on this trip from one place to another, as I prepare to enter into heaven in this lifetime, I know that you are always with me. And even though my foe and enemy rises up against me, I find delight in thy law. And because I have studied your word, because I delight in your word, because I'm taking your word to you in prayer, those things that I may not understand, those things that I've prayed for wisdom in, those things that I've prayed for knowledge in, those things that I've prayed for understanding in, and because you have enlightened me, I know more than the ancients, because they rest their faith and their trust in secular knowledge. But because I place my faith and my trust in your word, in your law, in your precepts, because I allow them to be my light, I know more than anybody in the secular world does, simply because I know you and your law. You know, the more that we delight ourselves in the word of God, the more we study the word of God, and we build our relationship with God, the more we realize how foolish the things of this world are. The more we can realize how foolish some of the thinking is, the more we can delight on the side and join the Apostle Paul when he said about the signs of this world being falsely so called. We can look at them and they can scout, scoff at us for believing in it and all supreme God, but yet they place their hope and trust that everything came from a giant bang and there it happened. But our trust and our delight needs to be in God and His Word. And the more we study, the more we pray about, the more that we apply it to our lives, the more we use the Word of God that we may develop our relationship with Him, that we may know what is right and wrong. What would be better? Us to stand before God and let Him judge us about everything wrong in our life, or us Go before God on our knees and say, God, if there's anything in my life right now, you know what, judge me that I may get rid of it now before I stand before you on that great day and maybe I'm embarrassed because of something. May I not be foolish, Lord, but teach me thy precepts, teach me thy ways, teach me those things that are pleasing in your sight. Give me understanding in spiritual matters. Those things that maybe this world considers foolishness, Lord, teach me that I may apply my heart unto wisdom. Does anybody have any thoughts, anything they want to add at this point in time? So if not, let us bow our heads and prepare our hearts for service. Gracious Heavenly Father, we give you all praise and glory for everything you've done for us and shall continue to do. Lord, we give you all praise and glory because your God who reigns on high and that there's none like you, Lord. Even right now, we rebuke any attack the enemy that should come our way. We pray that you send your angels on the four corners of the property above and below, and no attack of the enemy may penetrate. I pray that our hearts and our minds will be in one mindset and one accord, that we may worship you in sincerity and truth, that the Holy Ghost may move as it so desires, Lord. 
I pray that our hearts and minds will be surrendered, Lord, that you may be with us accordingly, that we may not stand before you one day in judgment, embarrassed, Lord, but may we get the dross out of our life now, that we may be pure and holy in your sight, Lord, that it would not be burned up works, Lord, pay and smell, but Lord, may we present with you fine treasures, Lord, gold and silver, not because of who we are, but because of who you are. And with the song leader and the musicians as they lead you upon the string instruments and the vocal cords, Lord, as they lead us in the songs you'd have us to sing, anoint the pastor's mind and his lips as he brings forth your word today, Lord, and anoint our hearts and our minds to receive it with gladness, that we may meditate upon it throughout the week, Lord, but Lord, if you greater than that, that we would apply it to our hearts and we would be transformed into the very image of Jesus Christ. We ask all these things in the name of Jesus. How are you?